Welcome to We Can Talk About This, conversations with Jonathan and Krista Threlfall about ideas shaping us and the world we live in. And today, we are talking about the top four reasons that people tend to doubt their faith, specifically the Christian faith. And these may not be the top four reasons necessarily, but at least they're the top reasons that came to our minds when we yeah. were thinking about the topic. There are um, top four reasons. <laughs> there, are top, oh, there are reasons that um, people we've talked to have, have said that uh, they struggle, people that I've talked to um, that have wrestled through these things. And so uh, we want to go through these one at a time. Yeah. Are these only um, experiences with people that we've talked with? Um, no. I nope. mean, they're, they're wrestling, uh, wrestlings that we've had personally, yeah. uh, that I've had, mm -hmm. and that we read about and that we hear about. Yes. And these these are the ones that come to mind as to be as to maybe stumbling blocks or mm -hmm. something that someone might just trip over along their, their following Christianity, just trip and, and maybe they fall off the path. And yeah. for a time, stop believing, mm -hmm. whatever that means. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're struggling with one of these things. So we'll jump right into it. Uh, the first one is painful experiences mm -hmm. so we're talking about trials talking about suffering unexplained suffering um so i i assume you've talked with people mm -hmm. that have gone through things that are really really hard that yeah. make them question yeah how, how do you think that like works into the human psyche when it when it relates to our christian faith yeah i mean i've talked with people and i've struggled with this myself so it's not just like oh we happen to you know experientially know peop other people who have struggled with this these are struggles that we have had yeah. as, as we've walked through painful experiences i like the way that you've talked about trials in the past um that they can put pressure on our faith mm -hmm. so i say that i believe that god is kind in in the things that he does mm -hmm. and then i experience something that is the opposite of yeah. kind and and i'm like okay that puts pressure like why would god allow this if he's kind and if he's good it puts pressure on that belief that i said i had um and so a painful experiences do that yeah yeah especially ones that you can't draw the line between the pain and god's purpose yeah. you can't draw the line between the situation right now and okay man, well, at least I know that God's doing something good. And in two months from now, I'm going to be in a better place. It's it's experiences like the, the death of a loved one. Uh, maybe someone has been assaulted in some way, hurt that's near you. Uh, you've lost your home. You've lost finances. Something like that has happened. And you cannot see how God could possibly be justified in allowing this. Mm -hmm. I think this is where the rub comes. It does. It, it comes in like, I cannot conceive of any situation in which a good God would allow this kind of thing to happen. Yeah. Um, there are lower level pain that we can justify in our minds because we can trace the line between the pain and God's purpose. It, I like to think of it as when you work out and you exercise, they say that uh, your muscles are undergoing all these micro tears mm. and you do, you purposely do that because you know that it's going to heal. And when it heals, it heals stronger and, right. and bigger. And so you, you, you see the progress and you're putting pressure on your muscles and you know it's happening because you know you're going to get stronger. Mm -hmm. But what if there is like a, a gash that doesn't strengthen the muscle? Right. And that's what these kinds of things. So people, well, I think that there are two levels on which people could struggle. Sometimes some people struggle on one level or the other. Sometimes people struggle both. I think there is the emotional level where just on an emotional gut reaction, like I, I can't believe God, I can't trust God anymore because this has happened. And then an intellectual level, you can, you can, you can, uh, Put it out like an argument. You could say, God is good. Bad things happen to me. Uh, I can think of no reason why God would allow such a thing. And therefore, I cannot trust. I cannot believe in God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just want to push back a little bit on this idea of being able to trace my pain to God's purpose. Okay. Because I think sometimes we're really quick to try to figure out, okay, this this person passed away what was the reason for that? Or like, I've heard people say before, you know, this loved one passed away, but at the funeral, so many unbelievers heard the gospel. And so maybe that was the reason why. And I think some, sometimes we, I, we can try to put um, a reason to it and be like, okay, this is why God allowed that. But the reality is we never know all the reasons that God does something. And we never know all the ways that he's working. But 
But if we believe the Bible, then we'll believe that he always is working. Right. And he's always working for our good, even if his definition of good doesn't line up with our right now immediate yeah. definition of yeah. what good should be. Yeah. I think that I, what I'm saying is that the mistake is assuming that you have to trace the line between okay. your panic. That yeah. is the mistake. Yeah. Because even even when you think you can't, even when you think, okay, um, and I I really warn people against trying to do this mm -hmm. when they say, yeah, we got in a car accident. Uh, it was a fender bender, but I realized that like three miles down the road, there was a massive pileup and three people were killed and that would have been us. So that's why God was allowed to do that. It's like, wait, you have to explain why God was allowed to do that to, in order to justify in your mind why that happened. I, I think what, if you begin making that the rationale for God's actions, why you can excuse God for various things, then when something does happen for which you can think of no rationale, then God is guilty mm -hmm. in your mind and, you, yeah. and he's not trustworthy anymore. Right. So no matter what happens, whether or not you think you understand the reason or or not, you can't you can't make put God in the witness stand. Right. But what sometimes and, and we're talking about reasons people doubt, sometimes it hits hits you so hard or hit, hits me or you so hard that we're like, I just can't trust God anymore. Yeah. I, I, there, I, there was one time when I used to go to church and I used to sing the songs with everybody else. And now when I sing uh, a song like Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, I can't lean on those everlasting arms yeah, anymore. Right. I just can't do it. Because, in fact, I, I know people who have gone through such lost children, for example, and not only feel that the pain of that, but also feel that somehow that was God's punishing them mm. for something they had done. So now every time you think about God, you think about the God who punished me by taking my children. Mm -hmm. How could I ever go and sing in a church? Yeah, That's a, that's a big, uh, heavy uh, reason why people uh, tend to doubt. Yeah, yeah. Um, so again, we're not giving solutions at this point. Right. We're, we're, just, just, we're just identifying reasons. Yeah. Um, so going through painful experiences, there's the emotional yeah. objection of like, this hurts. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I thought God loved me. Um, you know, Psalmist says God is good and God does good. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand how that lines up with this. Yeah. So that that causes questions and doubts. And really, it should. It should cause you to question, like, how, how could both of these things be true? How could I be feeling such pain? And how could God be able to work all of these things together for good? And, and what does that mean? So it's okay to ask questions. It's, it's okay to doubt. It is. Yeah, we should ask questions. Should we doubt? Would you like to answer that? No. No, I asked you the question. <laughs> <laughs> should we doubt? Um, well, the Bible speaks of having faith. Yeah. So we sh should hold firm our confidence mm -hmm. you know hebrews says multiple times like holding firm the confidence that we have because mm -hmm. god is faithful yeah i'm not gonna say we should doubt i'm gonna say we do okay. i'm not gonna say yes every christian should doubt i think every person should question every person so, should think through their faith which, and in order to think through your faith you have to ask questions about exactly it. right yeah so and and if you if you're if you have a, a faith that you know maybe you've grown up with and and then sometimes you might experience something really hard in your life and then you're like okay i grew up with this is it really true mm -hmm. that can be a time of doubt for you which can serve to make you a stronger christian yeah. a stronger believer where you're like it's it's almost like um i love plants okay and and one thing with watering is is that you you don't want to just water like every day you want to wait until the soil is dry and it's different for every plant but you know what happens when the soil becomes dry the roots go deeper to find water and if you just keep watering it at a surface level then the roots won't ever grow deeper and so doubts can do that for us like okay i i believe god is good i've, I've grown up in a Christian home and, and all this, and you, then you experience something really hard. Mm. And you're like, is God good? You have doubts, you have questions. And by, by letting those roots grow, grow deeper, you can like push down, mm. push into the word, push into prayer, push into other believers and be like, is this true? And God can lead you to a stronger place because of it. That's really good. So, 
Yeah. So those those are it's not like yes every person should doubt, but every person should should question. Yes. And look to the word. Yeah. For the answers. You know, I never knew that about plants. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's very powerful. It's a very powerful illustration. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use it. I'm going to steal that from you. Okay. And I might not credit you. No, I will credit you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'll be hearing from my attorney. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually really powerful. It I is. like that a lot. Yeah, it's very good. Um, when it comes to doubting and when it comes to questioning your faith, I think if you grew up in a Christian culture in which not doubting meant look looked like putting a smile on your face and having a very neat testimony to share with people in which every tension had a resolution, and that's what the living the Christian life looks like, then it may alarm you when you have questions that are unanswered mm -hmm. and stories without a resolution. But you should not be alarmed by that because what, what I what I might suggest to you is that what was presented to you as real uh, faith may be, might have been a little shallower than it should have been. Because when you read the Psalms and you read the book of Job, you find that people are asking really hard questions and it's okay. It's good, in fact. They're yeah. pressing toward. They're pressing toward God by asking questions. Not. They're not moving away from God by asking these questions. They're pushing toward Him. Pressing. Yeah. Toward. I think that's. I think that's an important distinction to make between um, doubt, the kind of doubt that Jesus doesn't want us to have. For example, He told Thomas. He showed him his his hands and his his side, and He said, "Stop doubting. Right. Stop disbelieving and believe." Right. Yeah. So Jesus wants you to believe. James chapter one. Right. It talks about the person who doubts being like a wave of the sea driven and tossed. And that's not the sort of person we want to be. But that doesn't exclude you. doesn't mean you're not allowed to ask questions. In fact, you should. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, side note, just you talking about, um, you know, people who are sort of like always smiling yeah. and always just, you know, the Lord has a purpose and 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 just sort of living in the this like little shallow five top five percent of mm -hmm. Christianity type thing. It makes me really tired and wearied because I, yeah. I, I think that um, we, we do a discredit to, to Christianity mm -hmm. when we feel like, okay, we always have to have the answer right. for God allowed this and this. Yeah. God works, like God works all things for, together for good. Um, just to like quick slap a bandaid on this. And mm -hmm. instead of like, there are, there are real heartaches and heartbreaking things that happen, and we do not always know why. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to say we never know we why. We never know why. Right. <laughs> like, but, but it is in the not knowing why this happened, we can still have confidence in right. God, and that's what we call faith. That's right. Yeah. Do, you know, and that's why we're called people of faith is because we believe even when we don't know all the answers. Yeah. Why? So I think we can we can cheapen Christianity when we're just like, okay, just put on a happy smile, right. just go to church, just keep up the image, just just do this. And it's like, no, no, this is that is not what the gospel is. Yeah. That's not what the gospel has freed you to do. Yes. Yeah. That's to that's so good. And I think I, I think of the Beatitudes, for example. Yeah. Blessed are those who mourn. Mm. Blessed, it's, I didn't say blessed are those who have figured out some happy ending to their story. Yeah. But blessed are those who are mourning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You you feel genuine sorrow. And I, I, I think we have to have a Christianity broad enough to encompass the phases of life in which we simply are without answers and are in a really tough spot. Yeah, yeah. Um, that I think I, I don't, we would move on here, but I just want to say that I think sometimes like we do a disservice to the Christian faith and to Christ himself when every testi public testimony has a happy ending. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not saying that we shouldn't share testimonies with happy ending. I'm saying like you, you, the, for the for the 5% of people that have a happy ending, you've got 95 people who are like, my, <laughs> I don't have a happy ending. Like I'm in this. And yeah. I think the church is a group of people who are in this right now. That's That's what it means to walk by faith. Yeah, well, and I mean, we can all be in different stages too. Like some people are kind of seeing the feel like they've come to the end of a certain season or trial, and they're like, "God brought me through." And then others are right in the middle of yeah. it too. So. Yeah. Okay, so we've we've looked at painful experiences yes. as being a reason people doubt, and then we got on the sidebar as to whether it's okay to question yes. your faith, mm -hmm. and we're saying yes, you should question, you should ask questions because that's a way in which your faith can be deepened, yes. right? Um, the, a, a second reason that people tend to doubt or a second uh, stumbling block um, 
it's Christians themselves. So when Christ, other other people, other Christian people um, have hurt you in some way or have demonstrated hypocrisy and that they have yeah. they have turned you off mm -hmm. to the Christian faith because of their unethical behavior or um, and that's a really big one. This is a really hard one mm -hmm. because Christians are supposed to be Christ's witnesses. Like yeah. Jesus said, Acts chapter one, verse eight, you shall be my witnesses. You shall bear witness to the fact that the king of the universe is alive and he's at work among you. So live like me, tell people about what I've done, be my witnesses. And then people who say, I'm a Christian and they, they're they dishonest with you or they bully you or they create like church cultures in which you feel trapped and it's a bad situation. Yeah, yeah, and we touched on this a little, a little bit from a leadership yeah. point of view in our episode about when the pastor of your church hurts yeah. you. Um, but we talked with a family a while ago who had been involved in a ministry that they had been saved in. Mm. Um, but as they got more involved in, and there was like a school there, um, they started seeing more of the inner workings of it, and they're new, new Christians, and they're looking at. The scripture and they're looking at the way people are acting and they're like this doesn't measure yeah. up um and so that that is something that the bible is anyone can look at that anyone could read that mm -hmm. and see what the standard is yeah and so that that's the reason why we know there there is something like hypocrisy yeah because we we read these things about what love is and what a leader is supposed to do in, in serving mm -hmm. and what good doctrine is supposed to do and how it's supposed to be lived out and then we see people who aren't doing that yeah. and th that's that is the bible is the reason why we know there there is a standard and yeah. you aren't measuring up right yes i think that's important because it it's a caution yeah to people not to throw away the whole the standard itself right just because people who claim to live up to it didn't mm -hmm. um but the the thing that I think we're seeing more and more in our, our culture is this idea that, um, well, I'll back up a little bit and say that to be a follower of Christ means to follow Jesus, Christ Jesus, in community with other people in church. Okay. Yeah. Now, what if you you get you go to a church and you find out that they're really cultivating a hypocritical culture, mm -hmm. an environment, and so you go to another church and you find that there's like rot in the leadership, yeah. and they're they're hurting people or extorting people to someone. You go to another church, and then you begin to draw the conclusion that every community of Jesus followers is somehow rotten to mm -hmm. the core, right. and then you begin to conclude that. I can't follow Jesus if following Jesus means following him in community because every Jesus community inherently has these toxic issues. And I think that's that's a narrative that I'm beginning I uh, hearing a lot. Yeah. That there is baked into the structure of churches uh, an abu abusive environment. Mm -hmm. And that turns people away from the Christian faith because and and they may for a time say, "Well, I could still have a relationship with Christ and and not be a part of the church." But that's that's a hard position to hold if you just take what the Christianity is about, and that is following Jesus in community. Mm -hmm. And so eventually they get to a point where they just stop following Jesus altogether. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And this is these are some topics that we'd like to deal with in more detail in yeah. the future. Um, but for now, we're just going to move on to our third one. Okay. Um, which is, so painful experiences, yes. hypocritical Christians yeah. Yeah. or churches. And then another reason people might doubt is having intellectual objections. Yeah, yeah. Which doctorate of apologetics, <laughs> take it away. Well, the, the, I do love this topic because I I really believe, and thankfully the more I study Christianity and the more I study the world, the more I see that you can't understand the world rightly without the philosophical undergirdings of the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. which, which, quick pause. Yes. Isn't this the intellectual objection isn't this when you first started questioning right Christianity? yeah yeah how do i know that i'm right this, right. this, this is, is right. i mean this is like the we're talking about this third way of yeah. doubting and third reason and yeah. this is the reason that kind of set you on the that's path. that's right yeah if how do i of all the faiths in the world and of every age i could have been born in mm -hmm. in any part of the world i happen to be born in a place where my parents taught me that there is a God and 
he reveals himself in Jesus Christ who mm -hmm. died and rose again for me. That's a really specific faith. And it was very troubling to me to consider if I had been born in another part of the world that I would probably believe something very different. So how do I know that there's any, how do I know I'm right? Yeah. How do I know this is true? Um, and so that, again, like Krista said, got me onto the journey of, of exploring the intellectual uh, reasons for believing Christianity. But again, that's that's a long time ago, and I've been on this journey in which I continue to see, yeah, unless we us go into the world assuming mm -hmm. what the Christian faith teaches us about, a creator who makes himself known, who made this world on purpose, who uh, made it for his own glory, unless we go into our lives with certain faith assumptions, we can't even do science. Like we, we can't even, for, for example, in order to be a scientist, you have to have some sort of assumption that is scientifically unproven that that th that nature is going to operate with some regularity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so unless unless you think that things can pop into existence, uh, that things just happen for no random reason at all, like you yeah. can't do science that way. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, how do you know that? How do you know that things don't pop into existence? Well, you. You believe that they don't like you believe that there's some some consistency mm -hmm. where did that belief come from well as we look at not to get too historical on us at the scientific revolution and then uh we, we find that these men these men were christians mm -hmm. like they believed that god was a creator who is both distinct from and yet infinitely above his creation who made all this for his glory mm -hmm. so what i'm saying here is that the more you get into understanding what the intellectual framework of Christianity, you see that it does undergird so much of what we what we know. Now, why though would people say that intellect they have intellectual objections to Christianity? If here's why: you go to a university setting, and your peers around you and your your professors um, give the impression that you cannot be an intellectually responsible person and mm -hmm. hold to the tenets of Christianity. Yeah, and so you suddenly feel like you 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 have a tension. I am either going to be intellectually respectable, or I'm going to be a Christian, but I can't be both. Yeah, yeah. For example, um, I I can't believe I can't be intellectually respectable and believe that a man came back alive. Right. So what am I? Am I a dumb Christian or a smart secular person? Mm -hmm. And that can cause people, and I know people like this, that they've gone, they've grown up in a Christian environment that hasn't dealt with the deep level of the reason for, for their belief. They've gone to a university and then they've assumed that the two are incompatible. Yes, yeah. Which so. just points, points to the necessity of questioning right. and digging deep for answers. Yeah. And don't be satisfied with the shallow, like, okay, God loves me, God sent Jesus. Like, yeah. okay, what does that mean? Yeah. What it, like press into that? What what does that mean? And how do you live that out? And yeah. what what bearing does that have on today? Yeah. So you know, I talked just yesterday with a couple at church whose son is probably junior high, and they were saying, Our son is asking us such hard questions we can't answer. Mm -hmm. He's he's asking questions about God's sovereignty and human free will. And we know there's answers, but we just don't we just haven't thought through as deeply as he has. And we want to be in a place where he can get answers to that. And I'm really glad that they're taking that approach with yeah. him. And saying it's like, oh don't you know, don't worry about it, or or you know, that they're don't think about that. Like, no, don't think about that. Right. Yeah. Learn to encourage, I, just for parents, like learn to encourage the life of the mind. And especially Christianity is a very, it's a belief that engages our thinking. Mm -hmm. It's it's not an irrational thing. So, but that's one reason why people tend to doubt. Okay. Yeah, which, which small plug yeah. in there, small plug for like, whether it's interacting with children as parents or interacting with unbelievers, um, this is... A reason to interact with people yeah. who think differently than you, who will ask questions that you won't know the answers right. to, um, and, and it'll make you think, okay, what? Why do I? Why do I believe this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and do I believe this enough to uh, and understand it enough to be able to explain it to someone who hasn't grown up in the church yeah. that I've grown up in? Right. right. So um, that that can be a way that yes, it can cause you to doubt. But God can also use it to deepen your mm, faith. Yeah. yeah so all, totally. all all of these all of these areas can cause you to doubt and right. can serve to deepen. Yeah, totally. So the last 
uh, reason why people tend to doubt would be, uh, sorry, let me just go back to one about the intellectual objections. And that is another category of intellectual objection would be this idea that all religious phenomena, all maybe even religious, like psychological um, experiences for religious people can be explained biologically so or or politically hmm. so oh yeah people believe in, in that region of the country because you know uh, this is going on with politically or um you, you begin to study the psychology of religion and and you realize oh yeah around puberty or early adulthood there tends to be at this time of someone's coming to grips with themselves as an independent person and they a conversion experience is common so then you could say oh is this just psychology you know or is this are there anything behind this are there are these things actually true mm -hmm. and that's that's a very important discussion as well but i want to mention that in, in passing in terms of those intellectual objections so the fourth category of reasons why people may doubt is when they see a very famous influencer um, or even a close peer deconstructing mm -hmm. Uh, dismantling their faith and that can cause them a, to question and doubt yeah it doesn't even have to be a close peer or famous person it can just be someone else mm -hmm. that you're aware of yeah because w with social media like we can feel close to people who we aren't close to yeah <laughs> you, you know and they don't even have to be famous yeah. it's just like they're they're relatable and you see them and and them deconstructing their their faith but i think the, the more famous they were as a christian or a pastor yeah the more disturbing their deconstruction is because you're like That's oh my agreed. goodness he preached these things or i first came to see the christianity under his ministry yeah. and now he's denying that yeah so if if he influenced me in can he influence me out right if he's de deconstructing why shouldn't i yeah. that could be really rattling to people yeah and um, that's another reason why people can just really stumble over that yeah um is there hope though yeah obviously there is yeah and i think we've talked about yeah. that a little bit like through each of these different ways that you could doubt different things that might cause you to doubt um that these things can serve to deepen your faith. right yeah um i was reading in a book called the bruised reed by richard sibbs and i love this what what he said it made me think about doubting he says christ's work both in the church and in the hearts of Christians, often goes backward so that it may go forward better. And here's a here's a plant analogy. I love it. As seed rots in the ground in the wintertime, but after comes up better, and the harder the winter, the more flourishing the spring, so we learn to stand by falls and get strength by weakness discovered. We take deeper root by shaking. Hmm. And that that is so true. Like it's yeah. that often things that seem to be taking us backward can actually move us forward in our faith mm -hmm. um taking deeper root by shaking um i have i have another plant it's like a tree and i have read <laughs> some advice to actually take the trunk of it and shake it mm. every every now and then because it's supposed to do something good for the roots <laughs> i don't know if this is true or not but but that's what i thought of when i read mm. we take deeper root by shaking mm. um is that sometimes by having having these questions if we take them to the lord and take them to the word for answers they will god will use them mm. to deeper root us yeah. in his word and in the the christian faith mm. yeah that's very good i think another way in which i see hope in this is people that may be doubting asking them what is your alternative Kind of like Peter hmm. responded to Jesus when Jesus said, are you going to go away too? And Jesus said, who are we going to go to? Um, every other alternative leads you it, to to further dis to despair mm -hmm. and to a, a world that has no meaning at all. Mm -hmm. And I think leads you to greater um, contradictions and conflicts. And it might be that you think, well, that's at least the courageous option. Like at least I'm just staring, mm -hmm. staring reality in the face. But if you take that option, if you turn away from the God of the Bible, then there is no courage either. Nothing. There is nothing mm -hmm. um, because everything lack, lacks meaning. So, yeah, there, I think there's hope in pressing further into what the Christian faith is. Mm -hmm. And that is at the very, very center of it is a God 
the God, the creator, who's revealed himself as a God of love mm -hmm. and justice. So even going back to the problem of, of pain, like an experience of pain and suffering, that it's not that God gives us a textbook answer. He gives us himself. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. that God just downloads to us information that somehow explains why he was justified in doing this, is he wraps us up in his loving embrace. Yeah that causes our pain to be swallowed up in victory. Mm -hmm. That's what Romans 8 is all about. You know, Paul talks about if we, the, if we suffer with him, we'll be glorified with him. And it's a glory so great that even right now, this fallen universe is groaning in anticipation of that. So what Christianity offers is better than answers to the questions of our doubts. It's it's God himself. Mm -hmm. It's an experience of his, his glory and his loving grace. So there is incredible hope in that. Yeah. And like Paul says in Romans 8 too, for in this hope we were saved. Right. Mm -hmm. This this is the Christian life is a forward oriented uh, faith. It it looks in hope to what God will do in remaking this world, and so yeah, those are some reasons why people doubt. And we just touched on a little bit mm -hmm. the, those reasons, but also some of the answers to. And yes. in coming episodes, we hope to deal a little more with those those possible answers to those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you go, just remember Philippians one. If you're in Christ. He is the one who started this good work in you, and he is the one who will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's good. Thank you so much for joining us. We will uh, post resources on the links uh, on We Can Talk This, We Can Talk About This Podcast.com. Thank you so much for joining us.